you so much that you've given us and we ask for so little in return father we uh, we, we make that effort right now and we pray these things in the name of jesus amen
Good morning. morning. Glad you're here today. If you're visiting with us, we're very glad you're here. Two questions I want you to consider that we will be looking at for the next several months, actually, and you'll probably get tired of hearing me ask these questions, but I want you to think about them. What can I do to love other Christians better? And what can I do to love my community better? This is the second sermon in the series, but dealing with the first, last week was the introduction. We're looking at the topic of loving better or to love better. And that's a challenge for us, and we're going to work at that for the next several months. And I hope it will be an encouragement. I hope it will be a challenge because it has been for me. And I hope that that will be some kind of uplifting point that it might be. Now, if you haven't purchased the book, what we're going to be using is a book by Aaron Chambers. It's called Love Better. If you haven't bought a copy of it yet, either physical copy or electronic copy, let me encourage you to do that. Uh, And you can read through and we'll do a chapter a week. Today, we're in chapter one after the introduction. Now, my topic today is love is patient. Is that a picture of you? If, If they had a picture in the dictionary of patient, would you be there? Now, I want you to ask you as you think about it, are you a patient person or are you easily angered? Now, if some of you are getting an elbow in the side right now, you know know where you're leaning here. Let me give you a little test, okay? Here, let me ask you some questions. And as you answer them, not audibly, this is in your mind, answer this for yourself. How do you react when talking with someone who talks very slowly? Do you want to finish the sentence for them before they get it out? How do you react when the car in front of you hesitates and the light goes green and they're looking down at their phone? Isn't that a great feeling? Are you the one that's quick on the horn? Or maybe saying some words? I don't know. How do you talk to the server who sits you and somebody sits down after you and they get the food before you get yours? How do you treat your server, your waiter, your waitress? Are you patient and kind with them? How do you react when someone is in the left lane and you're in a hurry, you're late, and they're going below the speed limit? What's your general reaction? How do you react when your children or your grandchildren ask you for a piece of advice, you share it, and they do the exact opposite thing, and it turns out badly? How do you respond? Patience. Sometimes that can be hard. Now, if we understand what it is, If we want to love better, we must learn to be more patient with people. That's something that I need to work at. Galatians chapter 5 said, The fruit of the Spirit, according to what Paul says that we should be developing, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against such things there is no law. Matter of fact, Paul, go ahead and turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 13. We'll start there. Each Sunday, we will be in 1 Corinthians 13. And by the end of this series of sermons, you may even have this section memorized. But over in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul is dealing with a church in Corinth that had a lot of divisions in it. And because of those divisions, he wants them to come to the ultimate decision that love is something that is vital to a church. And he says not only that, but there are certain things that make up love as an action. Let's pray as we start. Father, thank you for your holy scriptures. I pray that we would be a church that can love better, that we love, that we love one another better, and Father, that we love you better and the community you placed us in. I pray as we read your scriptures this morning, you'll uh, help us to understand it, put it into practice, Father, live it out in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1, if I speak in the tongue of men and angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all the mysteries and all the knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Now let me stop there. This first three verses, Paul mentions some pretty major things. The faith that can make mountains move, sacrificing everything he has, even his body, and being able to prophesy and know all knowledge. He said, all these are great things. But if I don't love people around me, then it's worth absolutely nothing. And then he goes on and he gives us instruction that is not as incredible as prophesying or moving mountains with our faith or sacrificing our bodies. He just said, but let me tell you how you can live out love 
Okay, verse four. Love is patient and love is kind. Love does not envy, love does not boast, love is not proud. Love is not rude, love is not self-seeking, love is not easily angered. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Love always protects, love always trusts, love always hopes, love always perseveres. Love never fails. So today we are looking at love is patient. And I might be preaching to you today. I don't know. I'm preaching to myself. What is patience? The Greek word here is actually made up of two separate words. The very first word means long. And the second word is passion or anger. So having long passion or long anger. It doesn't mean extended, but it takes you a long time to get there. That's what he's talking about. So it means long passion. So this word is not really necessarily about getting angry. That's part of it. But this is more about the idea of refusing for a long time, even if it causes suffering, to not let your passions get the better of you. That you may even have to suffer some as you work through this process. Aaron Chambers did it this way in his book. He said, we do everything we can for as long as we need to to keep ourselves from having outbursts of anger or passion. Y'all have heard the term before. If somebody gets angry rather easily, they have a short what? Fuse. We know what that's like. If you've ever experienced that kind of short fuse, you know the impact it can have on other people. Not only that, but I remember when I was younger, I would get angry and my mom would say, count to 10. Why do we count to 10? Because it gives us time to catch our breath, to calm down a little bit, walk away from the situation. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. That's just a good tool to learn us not to be so impatient. A couple other things that, to notice about anger and patience and being patient. Anger is not necessarily a bad thing. Let me say that again. Anger is not necessarily a bad thing. Scripture says that God became angry. And it also says Jesus, when he was in the temple and overturned the tables in Mark 3, that he became angry. So we can become angry but it can't lead to sin. That's what it warns. There's a warning in the epistles that says, in your anger, do not sin. There's a thing called righteous indignation to where you and I should have passion about certain things that we become angry, such as trafficking or child neglect or whatever it might be. There's certain things that should rile us up, but we also should be careful that that doesn't go further than what it should. Not only that, but we should also make it understand that people don't necessarily make us angry, do they? Let me say that again. People don't necessarily make us angry. They might know how to push our button. Anybody got anybody in your life that can push your button? They know which one to push. But our choice is to become angry over it or not. We can be, and I love the King James version of this description. It says it is long suffering. Patience, not always easy to develop. And not only that, but here's one of the things I have found in my own personal life. Anger destroys love. When patience is given in love, love flourishes. So we need to remember that. When our anger gets a hold of us, you can watch the people around you, the reaction. So what can I do and what can you do as we love people better? Well, one of the things that we need to do is see them differently than what we have. Sometimes we aren't seeing people as they really are or what we think. And, and I know I can admit to you, I have my own prejudices. Some of you may have your own prejudices. It might be somebody's race, the color of their skin, the country they're from, the, the, the things they believe about life, the things they believe about politics, whatever it might be. All of us probably have our own prejudices if we're honest about it. And as we look at people, and I've examined my own prejudices in the past, when I get to know somebody, I find it's a lot easier to love them than when I'm just making general judgments about the color of their skin or their attitude or whatever it might be. And so what we need to do is, I've got these very special glasses. And I call these my God glasses. Because you see, when we put something on like this, we get to see people a little differently, don't we? We should consider them from the perspective of grace and compassion 
and kindness. You see, these God glasses, if I'm looking at my life like I always do and my natural assumptions about people, I miss the opportunity to love and to be patient. But, but if I put these on, life looks different and people look at me different. But you see, that's what we have to do is look at life a little differently through God's perspective and how he wants us to live. Jesus was able to do that. He was God himself, God in the flesh. There's a great example of this idea of being patient. John chapter 4. Turn with me there if you would, please. John 4. Now, if you know where we're going, this is Jesus met this woman at the well. And talking about being patient with somebody, boy, Jesus was patient with this woman. Because she did everything she could to discourage a conversation with him. But yet he was patient. And because of that, there was this reaching out. Now, John chapter 4, starting in verse 4, it says there, Now, Jesus had to go through Samaria with his disciples, of course. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground uh, Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus was tired, and he was uh, tired from the journey. He sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour, about lunchtime, noon. When the Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy some food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Now, as I read this conversation, I'm not real sure how to grab a hold of it. What exactly was the woman's point. I know what Jesus' point is, but what's hers? What's her perspective? I can't, if I could watch it play out before me, I could maybe read her body language and the tone of her voice, but I can't do that. I'm just told what happened. But I'm going to make an assumption here. I'm assuming that she's trying to shut down the conversation. Well, I'm different than you. I'm a woman, you're a man, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. We don't have anything to do with each other. I assume she's trying to quash this conversation before it even takes place. And there's a suggestion that she is a woman that is ashamed of her own lifestyle because she's coming at the well at noon, and most women didn't do that. They did it early in the morning, but she's there at noon in the heat of the day. So I assume that's what's going on. But Jesus didn't ignore the woman. He could have. He could have said, you know what, fine. You don't want anything to do with me. I'm I'm not going to have anything to do with you. And we have that sometimes in people's conversation. We'll go somewhere and we'll start up a conversation with somebody. And you can tell if they want to talk or not because they'll close down the conversation. That seems to be what she was doing. If ever there was somebody the opposite of Jesus, this was it. Think about this for a moment. Are you able to have a conversation with somebody that is completely different in every perspective of your life than you are? That's not always easy to do. But you see, that's exactly what Jesus was doing with this woman. He was having a conversation with somebody that typically he probably wouldn't have ever had a conversation with. So we see Jesus in this moment looking and listening with compassion. You see... Jesus didn't need to put these on, but I do. My God glasses. When I come in contact with people, I need to listen and I need to see them with compassion because I don't know exactly what they're walking through. You see, that's exactly what Jesus is understanding about her. He is having compassion toward her. Verse 10, as you go back here to John chapter 4, verse 10, in this conversation, she's trying to shut it down. What does Jesus do? Jesus answered her. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you the living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw uh, from the well. It's deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as did also our sons and his sons and the flocks and the herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks the water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst again. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep drawing from the well. You see, Jesus was patient 
and he was kind and he was compassionate with her. And, and, and I love that question. Are you greater than Jacob? Are you greater than Israel? Absolutely he is. He's the one that created the well and the water to begin with. And is he greater than Jacob? Absolutely, and greater than all his sons. This is the Messiah, the king, and he will eventually reveal that to her? And he could have said, yes, you're right, I am greater than all them. But he didn't. He was patient and he was compassionate. He was slow with her, patient. And you see, he cared more for her spiritual moment than he did anything else in this conversation. That's how he's introducing himself. She was a woman. She was a different race. She tried to end this conversation. And ultimately, she was sexually immoral. Jesus knew that about her. But yet, he continued this. And you see, you and I can write off people rather quickly for a lot of different reasons. I want to give you an example where I wrote somebody off not too long ago, and then God humbled me in a great way. I was walking down the hallway. A gentleman walked in off the parking lot, and he had the wildest looking hair you could imagine, had a big long beard, had a t-shirt on that had all kinds of mess on it. Jeans were dirty, boots were dirty. And when he came in, he was kind of limping and staggering along. I put up my prejudice eyes. I thought, he's gonna ask for money, his benevolence need, I knew what it's gonna be. Well, he introduced himself, and he said, well, I talked to Jim Williams, and he sent me to the church here. I thought, I'm gonna get even with Jim for this. <laughs> he said, I'm to give you a quote on your parking lot to seal. I said, okay, great. He said, I'm gonna look everything over. I'll get back with you on the details of it. I said, that's wonderful, that's fine. Went out to the parking lot, and I had a good conversation with the fellow, and he was about as nice as you could ever meet. Just a genuinely good guy. God humbled me through this process because through the time that they would come and do the work on the parking lot, and not only that, but even following, you saw what a good, godly man this guy was. Kind of blew me out of the water. He said generally when he does a job for churches, he donates back to the church. Well, you know what? He gave a contribution back to the church when the job was done. And not only that, but they saw the job they had done. They had coded the whole parking lot twice. And it still didn't look exactly like he wanted. So you know what he did? He did sections of it three times. And then as they were finishing up the job, he was sitting under the portico underneath here. And he said, he was telling me about some of the things going on in his life. And he had suffered a stroke as the reason he was walking the way he was and even spoke the way he was. But he said, you know what? I praise God for all the blessings of life. He said, I have over 20 grandchildren. And he said, I had three grandchildren born this weekend. And he broke down in tears and said, I just praise God for all those things. Boy, I was humbled. I thought, God, thank you for letting me be aware of a lesson I need to learn. And you and I can do that. We need to put our goggles, our God goggles on so that we can have compassion towards other people and be patient with them because sometimes we're not. As we go on, you see here in verses uh, 16 through 19, Jesus has grace-filled eyes for this particular woman. Go with me to verses 16 through 19. He told her, go call your husband. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right. When you say that you have no husband, the fact is you have had five husbands. And the man that you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Now, I think she's trying to shut the conversation down again and change it. Jesus doesn't let up. Go on down to verse 25 and 26. The woman said, I know that the Messiah called the Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I am who you speak. I love that part of the story. You see, she was trying to close things down, trying to change them again, but Jesus wasn't going to let up. And you see, sometimes we need to put on our eyes our glasses of compassion and grace. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He didn't need to put on the glasses because he was God. But sometimes I do. I need to have compassion for other people. I need to care about them. 
Now, Jesus could have ended the conversation because he knew who she was. He knew exactly. You've had five husbands. You're living with somebody now. You are completely an immoral woman. But Jesus kept the conversation going. He whetted her appetite and offered. And then ultimately, because of his grace and his compassion, it says in verse 39, many Samaritans from that town believed him, Jesus, because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything that I ever did. Boy, that's interesting, isn't it? Here's Jesus revealing who he is, and the whole town comes to him. Now, I want to mention something also as well. We need to learn to forgive people better. Sometimes you and I hold on to grudges way too long. And I'm not going to say sometimes we don't feel like we're in the right. But remembering what Christ has done for us. And and I love that section of the scriptures where she said, you know what? The Messiah is coming. And when he comes, he's going to tell us everything we've ever done. He'll reveal these things to us. And Jesus says, guess what? I'm him. I love that part. And this is the earliest recognition in all the gospels that I'm aware of that Jesus revealed himself to anybody. And to a woman and a Samaritan who was a very ungodly woman, Jesus offered her something so very, very special. Now, two questions for you. I'm finishing up. What can I do to love other Christians better? What can I do to love my community better? As we look into our world and see, may we have those grace-filled eyes and compassion for those that are around us. Be patient with one another. Love is patient. Christ has set the example, and may we learn better from that. Angie gave me a quote. She knew what the sermon topic was going to be last week. And she gave me a quote that, man, I I had one conclusion for the sermon. And I took it out because I like this quote so well. I want to share it with you. The truth is that the more intimately you know someone, the more clearly you will see their flaws. That's just the way it is. That's why marriages fail and why friendships don't last. You might think you love someone until you see the way they act when they're out of money, under pressure, or hungry. Love is something different. Love is choosing to serve someone and be with someone in spite of their filthy heart. Love is patient and kind. Love is deliberate. Love is hard Love is pain and sacrifice. It's seeing the darkness in another person and defying the impulse to jump ship. Love is patient. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you love us and you're patient with us and you're kind. You're long-suffering towards us. Father, help us to love those around us, our community, Help us to love our brothers and sisters in Christ better because sometimes, Father, we fail so miserably. Father, we love and thank you for your kindness and your generosity. I pray, Father, as we move into a time of decision that you'll bless it. And maybe somebody's here today saying, you know what, I'm glad God has been patient with me for I need to make that decision to follow him. Give them the strength to step out. If there are those decisions to make too, Father, I pray that you give them strength in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? If you're here this morning and you need to make a decision, I invite you to come forward. If you need to be baptized, we can take care of that today. Or you have another decision to make. Maybe place membership. Maybe come forward for prayer. We invite you to come forward. Let's sing together.
Please be seated. In 1 John chapter 2, the Bible says this. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for for the sins of the whole world. Imagine a courtroom scene and you are there and you're being charged and we are in serious trouble because we're charged with sin and we cannot deny it. Um, and so we need an advocate. We need someone to speak up for us in our, de in our defense one to help, but his character is essential to our dangerous situation. Jesus stands up, but he does not plead that we are innocent. Our guilt is taken for granted, but Jesus is righteous. He has experienced everything we have, and yet he is without sin. And this is the one, the advocate, that goes to the cross in our place. He washes away our sin by his blood. He takes our punishment. And because of that, we are declared righteous. It is at this time that we remember our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's this time that we think of him. And what he did. And for many of us, during this time, just prior to taking the bread and drinking the cup, we reaffirm our commitment to him. And we are grateful for what he's done for us. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. 
Father, we uh, praise your holy name, and we praise you, Father, that you uh, love deeply. In fact, uh, we know that you are love. And we thank you for showing us your love by sending your one and only Son. And we thank you for Jesus, how he lived, what he died for, and how he rose again. And we thank you for this opportunity to take this bread and to drink this cup to remember the body and the blood of our Savior. And we thank you, Father, for redeeming us and forgiving us and showing us mercy and amazing grace. And through him we pray. Amen. Good morning. Um, I just want to let you all know of a service, youth um, activity, and senior activity coming up here in the next few weeks. Um, In the bottom of the bulletin, um, it says that Saturday, February 10th, we are bringing back our seniors. I hope I don't get it wrong. Seniors, students, sweets, and spaghetti. That's a lot of S's. Um, Coming up on the 10th, and that's in the gym. Um, If you have not attended this before, and you are either a senior or a youth, um, we would love to have you. It's just a really great evening that the kids look forward to, and hopefully our seniors do too. Um, Just an an opportunity for them to get together and and get to know each other and learn from one another. Of course, we're always on the other end during church, and so it's just a a really fun evening. Um, And of course, we have good food too, so that's a plus. Um, But we'll have spaghetti, and the kids usually will serve the adults um, spaghetti. We play bingo. There's lots of uh, treats. And so it's just a really fun evening. And so if you would like to come, we would love to have you. Uh, We have signups in this lobby for the adults. So if your senior would like to come, you can sign up on that table. And then for a kid, if you're a youth and you want to come and serve, um, the signups are in the children's wing. So two different signups for two different groups of people. So we hope to have you come. And if you would like to help serve, um, if you're not kind of in those age categories and want to just help, 
Um, Ginger Lily's kind of heading up the spaghetti, so if you'd like to help serve the food or, or fi fix the food, you can see either her or I to do that. So um, that's coming up, and that's all I have. Thanks. Thanks. I'll ask you to stand. Just a couple of things I want to make mention. Good to see Phyllis Fairchild here. Phyllis has been out for some time. We missed you, Phyllis. She's spirited as ever. So uh, if you know Phyllis, you know what I mean. Um, also, Sally Brownstead has a new grandbaby, baby girl named Daisy. Want to congratulate her. Let's give her a hand. She's got a picture or two, probably she'll be glad to show you. So, uh, but anyway, and also uh, tonight, 6.30, uh, taking up with Bible study with Jim. Jim's got the topics listed on the back of the bulletin. You may want to be there, should be interesting. Uh, so it, I, I think it'll be a good study. So anyway, want to make mention, uh, Wayne Park, or excuse me, Wayne Heberlin took a bad fall, got a number of stitches, is in Cabell Huntington Hospital, uh, should be released. Uh, did you say today is, okay. And so remember Wayne in your prayers and Agnes as well. And then also uh, Linda Carpenter, she is at Kingsbrook. That is Pam Williams' mother. Remember her in your prayers. And then also Fred Brewer. Uh, Fred's not doing well at all. He's at KDMC. Uh, just remember him and Glenda in your prayers as well. Let's pray. God in heaven, I thank you for the activities. I thank you for all that you provide. I do pray for the folks that uh, need you. May you be with Wayne as he's uh, heal up from this bad fall in the stitches. I pray also, Father, for Linda. May you be with Pam and the rest of the family. And lastly, Father, we pray you be with Fred and Glenda, Father, in the situation they're in. Thank you for today. In Jesus' name, amen.